the philanthropist raising money for us. So money came in, American dollars came in, and we would distribute them to the yeshiva people. A lot of the German Jews sent their boys to the yeshiva because they got a stipend. A lot of them became religious. In the ghetto itself, we all intermingled with each other. The Sephardi that had to go into the ghetto also became involved with us. But we had doctors, we had a hospital, we had a sheikhet, we had a moral of course, and as life goes on, we had a cemetery, hmm. and we had shows. Pesach was Pesach with matzah. I remember in the courtyard of the Ohel Moshe synagogue, my mother's one broken pot and six spoons and no really dishes where we had to table it to make it kosher for Pesach to be able to use the dishes on Pesach. My mother would make wine, cracked a couple of times. We, we made it life to be beautiful with the little bit that we had and grateful for all that we had. A lot of the boys who came, and I met with them and spoke to them, who came to the yeshiva, brilliant boys, brilliant boys, left because they left Shanghai before their parents put them to secular homes, and then they didn't want to have anything to do with the yeshiva world. But they were considered, and got, they got money, they got stipends. Mm -hmm. My mother would always tell a story about the soup kitchen, where somebody, a German couple came down, and you knew they were the intelligent, intelligent. And the woman said to her husband, Hans, Hans, to on thy kapische, the heile kachong kum. So, put on your yarmulke, they serve in chong. Now, which is the soup every day. I look at Shanghai, I look at Japan as a lesson of life. Life went on. The beauty of our lives were there in my parents' home, where they made the house be without, without complaints. The only thing I remember, and I never really realized until much later, that one day I came home from school, and my father was sitting on a bench, and he didn't, and my mother also, and they didn't talk, and they didn't say much, and it was like melancholy arose, and I couldn't understand. It wasn't the happy, jumpy house with all the noise and the children. We had no game, we had no toys. Toys were uh, sand and dust and, and rocks and frogs and bees and anything we could pick up. And, uh, and then I realized much later that the news came. My mother, a family of 11 children, a parent, gone. My father, a family of nine, gone. The only two that was left. The young boys looking at the walls, who's alive and who is not, orphans, and the mood. But by the same token, with the bad sadness, life goes on. And one of my favorite pictures that I have is, and I quote it all the time, is my pictures of the get of the shelter that we built. It shows life as a whole, unity as a whole, acceptance as a whole, and love of human of human beings. It shows women who were married either pregnant or holding a baby, young girls young boys, German girls. All of them, life, future, and the shelter with two entrances, that the rights of life, and we lived. That's, so, a very, that's a very beautiful image. 
Sorry? That, that's a very beautiful image that yes. you've just drawn. It's yes. a very beautiful image. Thank you. And I feel very strongly. I never heard complaints from my parents. I heard acceptance. And my life and everything is based on what I heard in the house. Acceptance. Uh, once I heard my mom say, Oi, my kind, that feeling is given nine Nainjua out. The twins were only nine years old. Never complains when things were but uh, grateful for grateful for being alive. And I feel now my mission is in these times of turbulent times when anti Semitism is bowing again so strongly that a message of hope and faith and belief and kindness to fellow man, a man like Shugahara who gave up his life to save someone, to do the right thing. A man that when he was finally, dis he was disgraced and ostracized and changed his name because here he was a super officer going against the, ki the emperor. And when he was found 26 later, 26 years later, and the first question he asked was, did I save one person? And he saved the world. And as a reward, when we wanted to do so much for him 26 years later, as a reward, he took nothing. All he wanted, his son Hiroshi, to go to Israel and study and get a free scholarship. This is Hesed Shal Emes, a kindness with not wanting anything back, but doing what, doing the right thing. And all of us will share this in this world today to do the right thing we would have a better world. Doesn't matter who or what, whether a Jew helps a Jew, a Japanese helps a Jew, a Chinese helps a Jew, is doing the right thing at the right time. And this is what living is all about. Your experience in Shanghai is, is just beautifully emblematic of the Jewish community coming together, all these, this diversity of the Jewish community. Uh, but also, I'm just wondering, what was the relationship with the Chinese in uh, in, in Hongqiu? In, the in the relationship, ghetto? we did not really have much of a relationship in Hongqiu because of the ghetto. People in settlement in French town did have relationship with them because they were in business and intermingled outside. We had, as a child, we had our own community. Mm -hmm. They left us alone. They liked us. Did they you did you feel us. any anti-Semitism no at all? No way. They, I said they liked us, but we couldn't speak the language. We spoke Japanese because it's easy, but Chinese has so many dialects. Uh, they would always come in to help us. We were always talking with our hands. They were always they were nothing. We had the the store the chicken place, the water place. You had to buy hot water because there was no... <laughs> With a little stick we had to buy water. Uh, we would use our hand to talk to them. They were very good to us. They thought we were strange, but we ate different food and we did food differently. We were odd, but they left us alone. They worked for us. We worked together. I saw no discrimination among anybody. There mm -hmm. was no discrimination. There was no, I'm better than you, or holier than thou, and come to that. No. The Japanese ruled, and the Chinese were terrified of the Japanese. We had Japanese friends. I called him the general who would come all the time. 
I had Takahashi, I wish I could find him. I had an ear infection, quite severe, and um, I needed sulfur, couldn't get it. And a day later, he came with the sulfur. I never saw him after that. But Takahashi, I have a picture of him, I have a picture of the general. Now it was just like all together. The Chinese and we would give them food if they needed food and things like that. It was, as I remember, in my complex, it was a healthy relationship. They did their things, we did our thing. We respected each other. And I also have from some of the readings of other testimonies that um, the, the Jews had a lot of empathy for the position of the Chinese. I mean, they were in a very bad situation. They were completely, they were occupied, they were, they were poverty-stricken in many cases, especially in the ghetto. Yeah, it was horrible. A lot of Rachmanis for the, for, yeah. for the Chinese, yeah, that's the it sense. Did. It was horrible. I could go in a rickshaw when I saw the rickshaw man with wounds, running in the streets, all with, with schmatters wrapped around his feet. They had nothing. You see a baby sitting and crying and there's not nobody. Yes, but that's the Jews. They help. Mm -hmm. The poverty was unbelievable. Poverty was unbelievable. We may do. I had to, uh, we were so careful what we ate, but yet we became a simple. We all went out. Very interesting coming from from a from a shtetl, and then this was part of your this was your rescue, and in your rescue you are put into this incredible multicultural environment, even Jewish multicultural environment, and then of course a relationship with the Japanese and with the Chinese uh, population is really quite it's it's so singularly unique. It's such a singularly unique experience. Because we were all trying to survive. Yeah, of course. We were all trying to survive. We were not in a march. We were not, we were not brutalized. We helped each other. Mm. Because we are, coming from a shtetl, we did not see all that wealth. So it was easier for us to adjust. That's an interesting perspective. That's an interesting perspective that I've not really thought about. Thank you. Because one thinks of the experience of the Austrian Jews and the German Jews, and their experience was different. They were coming, they had come on a cruise uh, uh, liner to, uh, to Shanghai. Very different experience. Yeah. They survived because they had possession. They had things that they were able to sell, but they couldn't adapt. Mm -hmm. And that was so hard for them. That's why. And, you, and you saw you saw that difficulty in adaptation. For sure. And what 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 are some of those examples that that you you, you felt that they that the uh, German and Austrian Jews and the didn't? Hunter, it, yeah. Bathrooms. Mm-hmm. A bathroom. Could you picture an aristocrat in a room with a curtain between his apartment and the neighbor next door, having to relieve himself? It is so humiliating. I, as a six-year-old, in, in Siberia, on the snow, have never forgotten how horrific that experience was for me. Mm -hmm. And you're in a room with your wife and children with the curtain. How could they? Mm -hmm. It's fascinating the uh, the incredible yeshiva life that came out of Shanghai. Would you like to speak about that? What, 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 you saw the Mir Yeshiva there, and then all of a sudden the Mir Yeshiva up to Brooklyn to Yerushalayim, and and everything starts anew. That's a miracle. That's one of the greatest miracles that ever was. If I think about it. Every yeshiva. Chachmei Lublin. Chachmei Lublin. Let me tell you, Chachmei Lublin 
Benny Fisher, I just wanted to say his wife, Benny Gelfish. He was 16 years old when he gave the keys over to the Nazis. Colin Stalin, Balogian, Baranovich, everything, everything eradicated, completely eradicated. Nothing came out of Europe, nothing except the Mir Yeshiva. But the Mir Yeshiva had twinklings of every place. Twinklings, a bracha here, a bracha there. I think parents with large families would send their children to the yeshiva, so at least they would have a meal there for us. But the poverty to be a tech, and then when the whole group of, went out of Vilna to rebuild, as when I saw Everson Cutler, who was with us in the ghetto, and that when the, it was bombing, she was in the house by us when the bombs came down and we all went to the shelter and I was chasing my little kitten and we had a fight on the street because she wanted me in the shelter and I wanted my little cat, Ketzler. And I went to tell Rachel that my husband is not in this world anymore and she hugged me, oh, my kid, my child, my child, don't you remember you hugged us your garage a bit? I saved you. I don't remember Jess. We were struggling on the uh, on the earth, and she wanted me back in the shelter, and she brought me back in again. And the next thing she said, "19 was too late, Adam Melucha. Would you believe?" Same thing with Jaffna. She said, "All I want is Jaffna. Who would believe in this day and age?" The Balachuva revolution. Who would believe that wherever you go, I go in Chicago and I see the secular guys, everybody's walking with a safer. Who would believe the rebuilding that came out of Shanghai and Hungary later because their war started there much later? Mm -hmm. And see Yang because and the head sits is flying all in 50 years, 70 years, sorry. When, and all those who came out of Shanghai, they weren't looking for money. They were looking to rebuild. And they rebuilt. And what we have today is beyond amazing. Not only in America, but the whole world. Tell me something interesting about my grandfather, the Prince Kabar. Please. I'm not good with dates. My grandfather was a powerhouse. Little guy, but a powerhouse. He was imprisoned for speaking his, for practicing what he believed in. And in 1924, he came to America, the first Knesset, where they wanted to establish Agudas Rabbanim. And he came in with a German rabbi. I don't remember the name of him. I have a picture I can show it to you. And the base Aachen, he wrote 22 books, one of them, the base Aachen, that he's called by said, America, this is the place where it will be rebuilt. This is the future for the Jews, America. I got a Habanim started. He went back to Pinsk and he was asked to come to America. You know, I can't leave my people. And he was there. He was killed in, no, he died in a hospital, but he was in the ghetto. So, this, in his memory, I want to mention mm. his belief in that. Mm -hmm. I feel, I don't feel Chicago, because when we came to Chicago with the wilderness, who would, my father more with his, oh, even better than that, I love that story. I'd like to share this with you. Again, I told you, I don't talk about what was, I talk about future, what we were doing. With Aaron Cutler, you've heard of him. Mm -hmm. But Aaron Cutler had this fantasy. 
that he wanted to build a yeshiva after the Chum. But he only wanted American boys. The Baron Cutler didn't speak a word of English. The American boys didn't speak a word of Hebrew because they all went to public schools. There was not a thing as a yeshiva world at that time. And he wanted, and he, and he recruited all the American boys. And he built up what we have today. And I remember when I came to Lakewood, we were all about 15 or 18 of us. Everybody American kid. Everybody went to public school. My husband went to college and public school. And yet his uncle, as Rabbi Feinstein, he did not go to to Bershish Lyman, one and only son. His mother wasn't going to let them go to, to New York. That's what he wanted, and he did it. Time to rebuild. Mm -hmm. And we are rebuilding. And we are rebuilding. Hayo, uh, what, um, what would you like to say to, uh, to uh, conclude in terms of the importance of the Shanghai experience for you, you were a young girl, and it, um, it formed your perspective in so many ways, and you've said snippets of it throughout the interview, but how, how would you like to just, would you like to just reflect on that as, a, as an ending, because this is the story of a, of a young girl experiencing all this. I'll make it very simple. Of course. Again, to our slow shot Bahim, our Olam Omeid, on three things the world stays. Al Hatora, Al Haboda, Al Gemilas Hasadim. Torah, you know, Torah, believing in God. Gemilas Hasadim is not just for the Jews, but for the world at large. We see that from those who helped us. If we can remember that the world exists on three things, Torah, Abode, Gemilas, Chassadim, a kindness doesn't have to be taking out a million dollars and giving it to you. A kindness can be a smile. Can I help you? Can I do something for you? Doesn't matter where it comes from. If we do these three things, Ha'olam will wait. Thank you very much. I hope my message comes through. Thank you.